want to actually deploy this. If you were to go with an agency like our service, we have quite a, quite a um, rigid format for the way we actually do things and the way we actually put an SEO program together. Um, it's important that you do follow a kind of rigid format, otherwise things will fall through the cracks and um, you won't achieve the goals that you want to kind of set out to achieve. So we break things into five phases. Um, first of all, you have a kind of research phase, then an educational phase, resource assessment, and then a planning phase, and then a final execution piece. Um, so when we talk about research, it's actually understanding the size of the task that you're trying to undergo. Now, um, to be honest, there's people out there who have been doing SEO for the past 12 years, and they've been doing it for such a long time that they've built up such a large base of content and links and got up such a large network, that for you guys to actually try and break in and compete against that person, you, you, you just haven't got the hope in hell. It will take you a very long time and a, very, a lot of um, hours of manpower and, and cost to actually try and compete with, with that and not with that site. Yeah, I would like to mention one thing out here is that the reason we show you all this stuff is that even if this is what enterprises will do for when they plan the SEO, even if SMB is exactly what you should do. So many times what happens is that some keyword, it's just impossible to write that keyword. You have to try for five years and spend max and max of weeks to write that keyword. But there are so many other low hanging fruits. And even large enterprises let go of certain keywords. So I'll give you an example. We work, uh, we work with a company called News Corp. It has Star TV, Star Plus, etc. Right? So they have 100 shows. Uh, they want to rank number one for their own show. So we say, you know what, 99 out of 100 shows will rank number one for you. But there's one show. If that show you want to rank number one, then you will have to spend 50 lakh rupees only for that one show. And that show turned out to be signed up. The amount of content, the amount of websites, the amount of pages for the keyword Sai Baba was just so you know, humongous that for hard TV to rank that keyword was almost impossible. So they said, oh, you know what, forget about Sai Baba, this is rank us for the 99 shows. <laughs> right? But that's the call that you as a brand have to take. Don't fight a battle that's just tougher to win, right? There are so many keywords where there is lesser competition, then you can rank much easier. You invest your time and resources. So even large companies with billions of dollars of market cap let go of certain things. So then what happens is we make it our golden right to rank for certain keywords. Right? The goal is to increase your business, increase your traffic. Find out the lowest hanging fruit which you can rank for because you have no competition. And these are the kind of techniques you can use to estimate it before you even start off. So whether large guys do this process, even as an SMB, this is how you should plan your SEO thing. Go after the low hanging fruit which you can give immediate value. Yeah, so kind of the research thing then to look at kind of what metrics you want to track yourself to, um, how you're going to track these metrics. The keyword selection which we've alluded to there is really, very really important. And you've got to do the competitive analysis of those keywords. And um, the thing about Google is every single keyword is, is its own battle. Some keywords are going to have a battle you can never win. Some keywords will have a battle which you can win. So it's important that you do that competitive analysis of those keywords um, so that you can understand what size of the task is. And then you can feel, well, this keyword I can do within a few months, and this one's going to take two years. And then it's a decision whether or not you actually do uh, go into that battle. Um, so you understand the size of the task. Now, the key to this is actually understanding the competition. And the competition are not who you feel are, are your direct competition in the real world. They're actually people who rank. Um, so it could be Wikipedia that ends up being your, your competition, because they're the person that ranks up there. So you've got to look at the, uh, the keyword, look at the results, and see who actually is there. And then you have to do a deep dive into why these guys rank and then work out what they've been doing, how much effort they're putting behind it, and then that will give you an idea of how much effort you need to put in and actually go and compete and, and uh, take over from these guys. So you start looking at the key indicators of each of the competition uh, and see what sort of size of the task there is. There'll be key indicators like, for example, Google Page Rank. There'll be things like index pages, the number of links they've got, how frequently they're being cached. Um, and all of, all of these kind of site indicators, we can go deep diving into this and actually see on a keyword level how many links a particular site has for a particular keyword, how much content that site has, how many other sites kind of relate to that site, and you can start building up a profile of the keywords themselves and what the size of the task is to go and compete in. So now once you understand that size of the task, you then make that decision, right, here's my low hanging fruit and here's the long term goals that I'll, I'll work towards, but I won't 
um, kind of spend all my money focusing on that. Um, SEO can sometimes be a complete black hole of money. When you've got someone who's been doing this for 10 years, they may have, say, two to three million backlinks and 100,000 pages of content. If you've got 50 pages of content and five links, you haven't got a chance in hell of kind of competing against that guy. So, um, so there's tools. Um, Majestic SEO is a tool, uh, it's a UK based tool. They crawl the web much in the same way as Google does. Um, and it's got a complete database of the entire web. And you can actually see all of the interlinkings of all the different sites um, through all your competitors as well as yourself. Now, um, you have to pay SEO models if you want to get access to competitive data. But to get access to your own data, you can get that free of charge. Now, to pay those like £30. Um, and then it is, and it's on a monthly basis, so you, you can do it for one month. Go and look at the competitors, look at the size of the task, look at what they're doing, and then you can have an understanding of what you need to do in order to kind of compete in that space. But um, it gives you a lot of information about all the backlinking and all the sites that actually start referring back to the competition. Um, so once you understood the size of the task, you need to understand the size of your resources. So how many people have you got? Have you got one developer? Have you got no one? Have you got just yourself? Um, or have you got an entire agency of 100 people backing you? Um, once you understand the size of the resource, you understand the size of the task, you then obviously map your resource to task, and then create a kind of roadmap to say, right, this resource needs to do this over that period of time. And there can be multiple people who actually get involved here. It could be people from the marketing team, from the product team, from the PR team. Um, it could be just yourself. But then you have to work out what the resource is, and then you map it to the, um, the efforts that need to be put in. So then you kind of create a, a kind of a resource to time and effort map to say, right, these guys, you need to be doing this, these are the deliveries, this is the delivery date of these things, this is when I want them done. And, and you make sure that you adhere to this kind of roadmap and plan um, and make sure these things are getting done. The reality with um, SEO is that if you do not do things, you cannot expect to actually get any results. So you must make sure that you plan it properly and that these things actually start getting action put in, uh, put into place. So, um, not. Yeah. Um, are you, So that's just an example. But if let's say there's a keyword and the keyword is, I don't know, uh, finance or something like that, and you want to rank for that word, you've done the competitive research and you found out that, I don't know, ICS Bank ranked for finance, and they've got 22,000 links coming from 22,000 different resources, which all have the anchor text finance linking back to that site. Now, if you're going to go and compute that guy on a very basic level, you're going to need to go and build 22,000 links. Or you can do what um or, or the vet was saying before, is that you find some very authoritative sites and get those to link in, which will value for a lot more than those 22,000 links. But unfortunately, it could be well possible that ISO Bank already have a very credible and very authoritative sites linking in. So you need to do quite an in-depth analysis, not just by the number of links, but look at the quality of those links and actually see where is the true value coming from uh, from these sites. And you might find that actually the rank is not because they've got 22,000 links, it's because they've got links from five page rank seven sites. And because they've got these five links, that's what's driving that, that rank. Um, and if that's the case, then you will need to go and develop five kind of page rank seven links, which I'm, unfortunately is a very, very difficult thing to do because page rank seven sites are generally very, very authoritative sites. So that's kind of a Times of India, that would be a, a sort of an ICIC bank itself. So that these are very huge entities in their own right. And so to compete in that level would be, would be near on impossible. But if you go and do the research and you find, hey, this keyword's only got, say, 50 backlinks, and they're all coming from page rank zero, page rank one um, sites, then all of a sudden you can be like, well, that's a fact where I can actually compete in. I can go and get 50 links of similar quality and then go compete in that space. So you need to get very granular down into the different words and see what the, which battles can be won in which spaces. Um, and the way we do it is we look at the position number one and we look at position number 10. At the end of the day, we want to get onto the first page. That's our first goal. But what you'll find is position number one might have, say, 22,000 links, which might be an impossible task, but position 10 might only have, say, 50 links. So the, the effort to get to the first page might not be as great as what you think it is. But to get to number one, the effort would be very, very great indeed. 
So, you, but you need to do that research to understand the size of stuff before you kind of go down down the research trying to optimize. If you just go and kind of pick a keyword and say, oh, I want to rank for that, and then you pick a keyword and start building stuff, it might be that you just pick a keyword which is a black hole, and no matter how much effort you put into that, you're never going to catch the guy who's, who's already ranking number one. So, and if you don't work that out in the first place, then you're going to waste a whole lot of time and a whole lot of effort for nothing. So, it's, it's important that you do do that research and work out uh, where you should uh, apply your efforts. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, correlation that can be done between an SEM campaign and an SEO campaign. Which are the tools uh, for this uh, research? Which so are Majestic SEO is a very powerful tool and it gives you all of the data of all links linked to every single website. And it will also tell you the authority of those links. It gives a scale of authority for the links. Um, SEO models will also give you a backing profile of the sites and also tell you the authority of particular sites for particular keywords as well. They're both paid for tools, but they're both uh, very uh, good at helping you out to understand the size of the task and what you need to, to achieve. SEO models gives you even more information and they'll tell you how to uh, mark up your site and it'll tell you if there's challenges within your site from an SEO perspective. So uh, an SEO model is $99 a month and uh, SEO is uh, £30 a month. Any free tools? Um, there are free tools. Um, so if you want link analysis tools, um, there's not, not any of these. There used to be Yahoo Site Explorer, but they, um, it, it, it doesn't give you any, any data anymore. Um, but that's more from a link perspective. You can use the link code on www.yourwebsite.com and put that into Google. That will give you uh, Google's uh, um, opinion of how many links uh, your site has, but it's an aggregated number. So, um, but I suppose it's actually, oh, I, I, I'd actually pay, if you have 30 pounds, I would go and pay 30 pounds and get the raw data, because it's, it's much bigger, it's so much more powerful. The free tools are not that, not that effective. There's a lot of free tools to do other things within the SEO space, so there's a lot of free tools to do sort of page optimization, speed optimization, um, and looking at content of the page as well, so you can see, you can do the analysis in that sense. But from, the, from a link perspective, I would use one of the page tools to actually get the information. Yeah. Uh, backlinks watch. Sorry. Uh, backlinks watch. Um, it's a free, free, free tool. It's the free tools will only give you so much information. They won't give you the full, full depth. So um, if you pay for a tool, you'll get much more information than, than what a free tool will give you. And it, it helps you. Like, it gives you a tool to actually cut and slice the data through it, um, and help you do, do analysis. So. Um, you can use the free tool, but when you're dealing with sort of 200,000 backlinks, then the free tool will not have the cap the capacity to actually kind of. So this will be good for maybe like 200, 300 backlinks kind of. Yeah, small numbers of backlinks, then fine. You, you, there will be tools like that, but then when it's, when it's very large numbers, you, you need to kind of get a bit more enterprise in that sense. Um, so cross pollination, um, SEM and SEO have some very nice crossovers. So. Um, if you actually start doing SEO to your landing pages, you're making them much more relevant for particular keywords. So because you're making them more relevant, you'll actually intrinsically improve your quality score for that keyword. Um, so by doing SEO to your pages, you're going to improve your quality score, which will in turn reduce your CPC. So there's a nice form of crossover there. There's also a nice crossover in that um, you can test ad copy through SEM and then push that ad copy into your SEO so that you're getting maximizing conversion rates or maximizing CTRs and that sort of stuff. So you can, you can leverage that as well. Um, also, if, you're, if you've actually um, got yourself to rank number one, you can start kind of asking yourself the question, do I need to pay for that keyword? If I already rank number one, will I get, I get the traffic anywhere, right? Or you can actually say to yourself, well, look, if I rank number one, and I'd also pay to be number one, I can then start doing some kind of dual messaging. So one message could talk about the price of my product, and the other message could talk about the quality of my product. So, one, so someone who's price sensitive who wants the cheapest deal, I've got a message for him. And someone who's more interested in that quality of the product, I've got a message for him. So I'm targeting two different demographics, two different audiences with the same uh, real estate. And so you'll double the actual like, efficacy of your, your marketing campaign. Um, so the key take home of SEO is that you, you can't build a house in a day. Uh, um, you've got uh, probably six to twelve months is what it might take to get a kind of uh, result. In, in, in very mature markets, it might take two to three years even. But uh, again, it all depends on what words you're going to target and what the competitive landscape of those words are. So you've got to do that research. And it might be that you just do a few little tweaks to your site, uh, and all of a sudden you, you get results. Um, all SEO should always be done in, in line with Google standards, which I'll talk about in a bit. 
Um, and you should never employ something called black hat solutions. You're basically trying to break Google, trying to spam the system and, and do these naughty things. They'll, they'll get their short term gains where you'll suddenly get a lot of traffic because you've done it. But when Google comes around to find you and uh, finds that you've uh, done these things, they'll actually penalise you and then you, you'll never ever see yourself back in the results. So you have a very detrimental effect to yourself. Uh, but SEO is one of those things, if you do invest in it, it does deliver long term quality traffic, which is effectively free. But you do, it's not free in that you still have to put the time and effort and, uh, and resources behind it to actually get the results. And, and it, unfortunately, it's one of those things where you have to invest and invest and invest. You might invest, say, six months before you actually see any physical return. And so it might actually take sort of a year to two years to actually see any return at all from your SEO program. So it, it, it's one of those things, but once you're there, and once you get in the traffic, then it's sustainable and you'll, get, you'll, you'll be able to um, sustain that and get a lot of value from it. Okay, so I'm now going to go into sort of, um, sort of upper gear a bit and go into a bit more depth about all of these bits and pieces that we've kind of covered. So uh, the architecture, the content, the authority, and, and the engagement, uh, and how we can kind of measure these things. Um, I wanted to look at Google and itself, so how Google actually operates and what it's trying to achieve. Um, SEO, information, how to organize, how to make it useful, how to integrate social media with that, uh, and then how to make your site universally accessible. And I'll, I'll come to why it's in this structure in a second. Now, if you actually look at Google, Google's mission statement, what they set out to do is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. Now this should be your mantra in SEO. If you want to actually show up in the results, you need to organize your information, make it universally accessible and useful. If you do that, Google will come in and find it as such and, and make it a uh, rank, okay? If you try, if you don't, if you kind of deviate from this concept, then, then your SEO is not gonna function. Okay? They've got, uh, as the web is saying, hundreds of PhDs being paid millions of dollars to kind of follow this mantra. So why don't we actually do the same thing? Um, so this is the original PageRank algorithm. Um, it was originally developed in 1998. Uh, it's hundreds of PhDs uh, since then we've spent the last 14 years to own, follow, and protect this. And as Rebecca was saying, it's 500 plus updates a year. So do you honestly believe you have the intelligence to crack this? I highly doubt it. I certainly don't. So, so, the, so the way I look at it is, okay, why don't we work with these people and follow the mission statement? And then obviously you have a better chance of uh, getting through. Now this looks really nice and complicated, but I'll try and uh, simplify it as best I can. This is the original map from uh, experiment that uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin did. Okay? Now, what they effectively started doing is they pulled the content, um, they came to a page, and they gave the page a doc ID. And they put the doc ID in an index. They then crawled the doc and gave every single word in the doc and a, a word ID. So every single word in the doc got, got an ID as well. Uh, they then basically break the page as these word ID hits and they store that in the index. And then word hits are, are valued and given weight depending on the type of hit that word has. So link anchors, big fonts, little fonts, plain text, titles, URLs, they'll all have different weightings for the words. Um, and so the page would then get weighted for particular words and have sort of this word is more effective for than other words who have less effect. Yeah? Yes, yes, so this, this is back to the day, this is, this is whatever it was, 15, 20, 15 years ago, right? Now they've gone much further, they've gone to synonyms, yeah. they've gone to synonyms, um, similes, um, they've gone um, to very, sort of, uh, to a much, much uh, greater depth. So if I, if I target one keyword, I may be ranked for the... So, yeah, yeah, exactly, yes, so, so let's say the, the, the misspellings you're ranked for, the, the uh, plurals and the, the ING, the IES, the different variants. Yeah. 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 Um, so the algorithm uses these hits and then uses page rank as a user feedback mechanism to spawn your final results. Okay. Um, so Google today, it pretty much uses the same mechanism that it was, what was the original white paper. Um, it uses the same kind of hit calculation, it's been slightly tweaked, but the, the kind of feedback mechanism. It, it, it's pretty much using the same thing. What it's now doing is it has uh, servers globally, clusters of them, all over the place. Um, and these servers crawl independently and have independent views of the web. And when you do a search, you ping off to the nearest server and you get that server's impression of the web. But when you're pinging, so your location will have a very different um, result based upon where you are, because you'll be pinging to a, a different server with a different information. 
Um, here are the lineage clusters, and they're basically your response is handled locally. Um, and so it will be dependent on which IP you've got and, and where you come from, which will dictate those results. Localized filters and algorithms are then overlaid on your original results set to give you a final set of results. So if I'm in Mumbai, I'll get a Mumbai set of results. If I'm in Delhi, I'll get a Delhi set of results because there's localization factors in. And then your own personalization filters as well, from you clicking around on the web and doing things, they're also overlaid on the original result to give you a personalized set of results. Um, so hey, there's no such thing anymore as a RAM. Because you've got a different rank to me, it's got a different rank to someone else. Because because of these all these uh, other factors that kind of get built in, there isn't actually a rank. So, but we, we use tools to give us a kind of clean set of, of results to say, well, that's my rank. But chances are that's only going to be the rank for say 30, 40% of the people, because all of the rest, everyone else is going to have a completely different set of, set of results. Um, so the Google bot, it used to be very simple. It used to go off, collect a URL, get the content, go back to Google HQ. Um, and it effectively what it does is it harvests the URL. So it's the URL that sits in the index, and that's what will rank should you start ranking. Um, now, that's why you have problems with things like Flash, JavaScript, and Ajax, because you don't have unique URLs for the content as it gets displayed. Um, so those sorts of sites have a lot of problems when getting crawled, but Google's getting a lot smarter um, with the way it actually now crawls the web. Um, so I was going to say, how many of you actually use Chrome? Okay, so we've got about half the room here. Now I'm going to tell you, you are all Google bots. Well done. You're crawling the web for Google and you're showing Google what websites do and how they work. Your, your information is kind of being relayed back. And how you interact with sites, how you scroll down, how you click on things, and how you engage with things is actually feeding back directly. So the Chrome is actually a is actually a spider in its own right with the way in which you actually operate with web websites. You know, we so, haven't glad Amit has one That's very true. Yeah, so, so they call it this, it's something um, SEO models actually did a test on, and they found out that basically there's this idea of headless browsers, where the browsers themselves um, are actually doing the, uh, doing the actual crawling of the web. It's the way in which you interact is just how you interact back. Now, it totally changes the way Google perceives web pages, because it's the web page itself and how it interacts. There's so much information that the users are generating from Google, they can really understand how good and how, how effective the web page actually is. Um, so, as uh, Rebecca was saying, it was, um, Eric Schmidt got hauled in front of Congress. Now, the real reason he got hauled in front of Congress was there was a, a, an update um, that went live. It was uh, this one, it might have been Panda, the first Panda update. And when the Panda update went live, there was a company whose entire business was because of Google. They, they, they were making loads and loads of traffic, and because of that, their business model was there. And there was companies that employed sort of three, four hundred people in call centers because of this traffic that was being driven. Now, Panda comes along, this business went out, out overnight because all of the traffic disappeared because of the Panda update, and 400 people who used to get phone calls no longer got any phone calls. So there was a big complaint put to Congress, and Congress was like, what's going on? And they, they pulled up Google in front of, uh, in front of the, uh, the Congress. So Eric Schmidt then turned around and said, right, um, 516 algorithmic updates were committed in, in 2010, whereas 13,000 were actually tested. So they're constantly testing. So this kind of goes down, but you've got to say, does SEO actually have a future if that kind of um, evolution is going on, if it's constantly evolving and changing? You could argue, no, it doesn't, right? But um, again, you just have to kind of fall back to the, to the old mantra, organize your information, make it universally accessible and useful, and then you won't have a problem. But just to give you an idea, this is one thing I always like to say to people, is that when you go into an SEO program, let's say you take on an agency and they're working very hard to get the results, Please do not kick them. If you're one minute you're getting loads of traffic, the next minute everything disappears. Now, you can kick them if they've done something very bad, but you can't kick them if Google's done an update and that's changed the way they look at things and the way they operate, right? SEOs are obviously going to kind of try and go where the cream is riches. Now, if that cream dries up and disappears and Google changes where the cream is, then the SEO has got to go and kind of find where the new pot of cream is and, and get that. So but this means the results are going to go up and down and the amount of traffic coming in is going to, going to change. But um, these are some of the big updates. And these, these actually um, change the, the way the results actually function based, based on these updates. Just to give you an idea, so I've got Panda highlighted here. Panda's still going on at the moment. They keep doing new iterations and new changes. But what Panda's been doing is it's been, it, it, its first update deleted one tenth of the internet from Google's index. Something like about 30 trillion URLs just disappeared overnight. 
Um, because what Google is doing is it's deleting um, bad websites, bogus websites, bad content, and bad linking sites, um, which are just basically there to spoof the algorithm. And so Google just was managed to, to determine what's good content versus bad content, and then literally just flipped the switch, which is deleted content from the index. Now, what this meant is every single site owner was pretty much affected, because I might have a website which is totally honest and good, and there's a website that links to my website which is also honest and good, but the website that links to that website has all of this white cat technique stuff, all of this bad links, bad content, and all of that. That website suddenly got deleted and removed. The value that was passing down the link chain gets removed and your ranking where you're number one suddenly goes to number 10 because that link just got cut off and the whole internet went into flux and every result was going absolutely bonkers and it takes a bit of stabilization but it literally each one of these updates will causes a flux and causes that kind of movement of rank all over the place so you will find um, it's a painful place SEO in the one minute you're doing really well and the next minute you're down 20 percent and you, you, you're kind of scratching your head wondering why but um, you've, really, um, you've got to look, kind of look a little bit beyond these updates. Obviously, it's important to understand what they're about. But I, I call key saying is keep referring back to Google's original mission statement and ensure that you're doing that. And then you, you shouldn't have too much of a problem when these updates come through. Um, so, SEO. Um, there's types of SEO. There's black hat and there's white hat. Now, black hat is ex essentially breaking the system, working out ways in which you can break the system and then you get a quick win. If you break the system though, Google will come and find you, and when they come and find you, you'll get a big slap and you'll never get back into the results, which is not good. Okay? So, white hat, Google, is effectively just helping the system and doing what Google wants you to do. A black hat would be links, 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 content, 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 keywords, 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 and cloak manipulate seed, and then now oh, I've got to set lots of links, 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 links. So you're kind of just trying to do things in such a way that you're just trying to link up links, 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 links. It, it, It's not the way it should work. It, it, all of these things you need to develop and build need to, be, need to have value, they need to give users useful information, they need to have value. If you're just doing things for the sake of trying to break Google, that's a negative way of looking at things, because eventually Google's going to find this stuff and, and come and clean it up and delete it. So in short, this is how you should know. Um, and if you want to actually get, uh, get results, you need to complement and help Google to achieve its mission. Which again, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. So it's simple, create information, make it organized, make it useful, make it universally accessible. So let's look at information to start with. Um, what is information? Well, I went and asked Google, because Google is the source of all information. So uh, information, facts provided or learned about something or someone. And then you look at the synonyms, intelligence, knowledge, notice, news, or and data. Are these forms of content? Yes, they are. They're all forms of good content. So how do we then disseminate this information? Well, there's lots of ways. We can use text, we can use visuals, we can use sound, we can use code, we can use applications, we can use interactions or learning through interaction. So if we're actually going to take Google seriously, you have to think of all of these different things and start creating content in these ways so that Google can actually find us and start raising us and ranking us accordingly. Okay? So content is therefore key to the whole thing. It's absolutely critical. Um, and then all these different types of content is what you should actually look at when you're trying to develop your sites and develop your, your content strategy. So don't just think about the plain vanilla text. Think about engagement, think about having a video, think about applications or, or widgets or ways in which you can get the guy in there which, which are carry interest for them. So then you've got to organize it. Okay, so you've got the content, but nine times out of ten it doesn't get organized properly, so Google can't find it. If you're, if you're not organized, you find it very difficult to find things, but if you're organized, you know exactly where things are, right? So, how do we organize? Well, site structure is a very important part in our organization. Um, content structure, the way in which you mark your content up, also has an important part to play. The location, how you set your location, and obviously signposting as well. So this is uh, a direct take from Google's um, SEO guide. So I would go to Google tomorrow and I would type into Google, Google SEO guide. There's a downloadable PDF and it gives you Google's uh, opinion on how you should do your SEO. It's a very good read because it's got lots of things which, which make a lot of sense, okay? Um, so, clear text-based navigation. Um, you should have a logical, organized parent child hierarchy. Now, what I mean by that is you should have a folder structure which makes sense. So, let's say um, I sell financial products, okay? I sell loans, I sell mortgages, I sell 
uh, credit cards, and so lots of different things in finance, okay? So first of all, I want to have a folder which says finance. That defines that I'm, that's my folder of information. Within that folder, I then have a folder which is my loans, I have a folder which is my credit cards, I have a folder which is my mortgages. And then within that, I'd have the pages which represent that. So I'd have my premium credit cards, my low interest credit card, I have all my different types of credit cards, and I have all my different types of loans, and then within those folders. But the, because of the structure, the search engine knows, right, here's a folder about finance, okay, and within that folder, I've got all of this content which is associated with finance, and in that folder, I find my loans content, I find, so the search engine suddenly starts understanding that your website's about these things, because it's structured in a way which carries a logical folder folder system okay so you should have in order to get this folder system to work you need to mark up and create the site in a certain way so you need to have matching url paths and navigation of breadcrumbs so your breadcrumbs are the breadcrumbs that are within the site so where you currently currently lie and then your um, folder your url path will actually dictate the folders so if you see here this would be the url path to this folder structure and this would be the breadcrumb path um, there's something called microformats um, and microdata and rdfas you can use those to mark up the folder. Yeah. Uh, I mean, instead of trailing slashes, I mean, can we use hyphen as a whole URL? No, because then you're not creating a folder structure. So you're then just creating a single page now. Okay. So if if this was all like news hyphen 2008 hyphen article hyphen name dot html, then that's just got a single page with no with no. It's not within a folder. It's, it's completely. Uh, in space. But the file may be there in the folder structure, but the URL is like that. So the, this, this, basically URLs, um, if you go to Windows, right, and you start clicking in Windows, you'll see your folder structure appear within that navigation, okay? So you'll but see. you see the blogs, yeah. blogs have a flat. Uh, so there, there are, so there's different ways of structuring different types of sites, right? So it depends on what you're trying to do. Now, if you're a product site that has a hell of a lot of content and a hell of a lot of different products, you need to break up your site into sections um, which, will, which will make sure that you've got that, those sections uh, mapped out. If you're a content site that's publishing news content or articles, then a very kind of flat hierarchy with, the, with no folder system is fine because all of the articles are just coming in one after the other after the other. Right? Whereas if I've got a site, let's say I'm um, a site that sells electronics, I also sell clothing, I'm a flip card, for example, I've got all these different things, I need to categorize my sections. So I have a men's section, I have a women's section, in my men's section I'll have trousers and shirts, and then within trousers and shirts I'll have different types of trousers and different types of shirts. You have to make that differentiation and break up and, uh, and compartmentalize the, the, uh, the, the structure so that when searching you comes in, you can understand that content and understand what, it, what it's actually building at. Okay, and it's done through the URL system and it's also done through the break, uh, breadcrumb navigation part. So if you see here, I have my parent folder, which is my news, and this would be that point in that folder, and then I have my child folder, which would be that, and then you have a physical article name, which follows after that. So it has a very logical structure and hierarchy to it. What happens in case of dynamic In case of dynamic URLs, you have to use mod rewrites, if you can. So you want to put logic on top of your dynamic URLs, which will actually rewrite the URLs into a logical folder structure. Um, if you can't do that, then it, could be, it makes it difficult for the search engine then to determine what this content is and where it lies. Otherwise, you're just creating single URLs and lots of An example of this, and, uh, what, what, um, rewrites. So dynamic URL, um, when you're looking at the URL, you'll see sort of like a question mark and then you'll see a parameter, and then you'll see equals, and then you'll see ampersand, and all these different variables and things like that jumped on the end. What a mod rewrite would do, would it rewrite each parameter um, and put those parameters into a folder structure so that the URL gets flattened and it looks like a single kind of folder. At the back end, the whole thing's dynamic, but at the front end, there's a rewrite module which is rewriting these URLs, so the search engine then gets the structure to work with. If you do not rewrite um, dynamic URLs, search engine find it very difficult to determine what the URL is, it might be difficult to crawl the URL, and it won't understand how it sits within a, a kind of context of, of, a, of, a, of a site. Um, so it's important if you do have dynamic URLs that you try and get your, your developer to actually rewrite those URLs so that they go into a logical structure. Um, and then how you actually mark up your logical structure is really important because if you, if you want to rank for things, let's say I'll go back to my finance example, if I want to rank for finance, I need to put my, my main folder as finance and when Google comes and crawls the URL, it sees that that folder is called finance, which means everything within that folder, all of that content is associated with that folder. 
So people know it's not, it's not just one page you're then looking at ranking, it's an entire hub of content. It will understand that you've got all of this content rather than a single page um, to, to rank. Okay? Um, Let's say my uh, important keyword is blue card. Okay. Yep. And uh, it has been repeated in the main URL and then it is repeated again somewhere in the HTML. Is yeah. That, is, is that okay or yes, it's, back? So, so when you're keywording things, you want to you do so in a way which is intelligent, not in a way which is spam. So you don't want to create content whereby, let's say I'm the user of that content and it, it says like, um, we're the seller of blue cars. Our blue cars are better than anyone else's blue cars because blue cars are the thing that we do because our blue cars are great. Oh, no. So exactly, you, you get what I mean, right? So you don't um, whack it in. You need to get the word into the right places. So if you want your page to rank for blue cars, then your page name needs to be, so the website's article name, the actual physical page name needs to be blue cars. So then Google goes, right, this page name is bluecars.html. Your, your page title and your, your title of the page needs to have blue cars in it. And then in content title, your H1 should have blue cars in it. And then the first block of text should also carry a blue cars. If you're doing that, then the page marks up correctly. But what if my site itself says it's a uh, card? So card is being repeated again. So, so that's fine, it's fine, but, you, you, but you'll pay your, pay car, your website's card.com yeah. and you've got a web page which is bluecard.com so you're, you're bluecard.html rather so that's basically telling the search engine like we have a website about cars and this is the bluecard page so all my cars on this page are blue um, so that, it, that's absolutely fine it, it's just marking things up in a way it's not, it's not repetition in any way okay. um, so site structure, so the things you need to do is use XML sitemaps. Google gives you the opportunity to put feeds together, which you can feed directly to Google. Uh, these sitemaps can be plain vanilla text sitemaps, or they can be new sitemaps, mobile, video, images, block sitemaps. So depending on the type of content you've got, you need to put your content into the right sitemap, and you need to feed that sitemap through Webmaster Tools, which is your free Google software, which you should all install. If you do not have Webmaster Tools, make sure you get it and plug it in. Um, what if, um, and you can submit your sitemap through Webmaster Tools. Um, now, Webmaster Tools is essentially a diagnostics kit that Google provides. You can actually see how your website is performing, what, what pages are indexed, what links there are, and how your site is. And Google gives you a complete diagnostics kit. So definitely um, install that. Um, you then use things like HTML sitemaps, which is basically the page, a web page on your site, which gives users the option to click to any other page on your site. So when the, when the crawler crawls, it has a one page on your site which actually refers to every other page with the, with the right links and right context you want to rank for. A robots text file, every site should also have a robots text file. Um, what it does is a robots text file, it tells the crawlers what they can and what they cannot look at. So if you've got pages that you do not want indexing, you would, you'd mark them in your robots text file so they do not index these. Likewise, if you want pages to be indexed, you still need to tell the spiders to come in and say, hey, index my site. So, and you can also put a reference to your site map. Um, ben, uh, one quick thing. You need to take a 10 minute coffee break. Uh, so, you want to end? I'll finish the slide. And then. Then we'll go. So, uh, another thing with, um, someone mentioned dynamic sites. A big problem with dynamic sites is no, nine times out of 10, you'll get a huge challenge with uh, content duplication. Dynamic sites will create URLs on the fly based upon what users are clicking on and where they're going. So it's possible to create multiple variations of URLs for exactly the same page of content. Um, and in Google's eyes, if it's crawling all these multiple URLs um, and finding exactly the same page, it will penalize your site for duplication. It will penalize the page and say, well, this is just a duplication. I'm getting multiple versions of it. So you need to manage that very carefully. There's two ways uh, uh, you need to look at duplication. The first one is, Tomorrow, go to your website and type in mywebsite.com without the www. Remove the www. Check, does the website appear in the browser and it still says mywebsite.com? If it does, you have a challenge with content duplication. Because I can access your website from mywebsite.com and I can also access your website from www.mywebsite.com. So there's two distinct URLs for the same site. And that means every single page of your site has a duplication. Um, and if that's the case, Google will simply delete one version of your site. It will just say, I'm ignoring this version, and I'm going to accept that version. And this becomes a challenge when people link to both versions. You'll basically lose 50% of your links because people are linking to a version that Google's ignoring. So it's important that you make sure that you manage that. 
content categorization, basically mapping, uh, making sure your content doesn't duplicate. So if you have multiple versions of the same page, you need to put a canonical tag in the page to say this is the original version of the content. So when Google crawl, crawls through multiple versions, it will be referred back to an initial original version to say this is my original version. So Google will only index a single page and then ignore the rest of them. Um, so sites should also have site search functionality, and again, use Webmaster tools. It's very important to plug in Webmaster tools. It will tell you a lot of problems that you might have. You do that through varying types. So you can have a folder structure, which will follow the domain, or you can have a subdomain for that content. Um, when you do this, you need to inform Google through Webmaster tools that this content is US content, this content is UK content, this content is Indian content. So you can mark it up within there. Likewise, if you want to search, appear in search results for local results, I would highly recommend you all do this because you're all small businesses. It's very important that you uh, submit a local search result for your products and services. It's because um, Google has location settings built in. If I'm in Mumbai and I search for a painter decorator, um, it will point, it will pull me up the one that's most local to my IP, and it will actually show the address, opening hours, and all that sort of stuff based on the local search results. And you need to configure that with Google, um, and, and by doing that, you'll then get the local results and the map up here in the results. And for someone like you, uh, that would probably be very, very uh, important for some of you. Um, and the thing about local results is Google gives them precedence over everything else. They actually take the first spot on the page uh, when, when, it, when it comes to the results. So signposting, very important. If you want a content found, you need to signpost the way. Now signpost is essentially done through links and the way in which you link. So here's two examples of some links. I've got pizza and mandra more, and I've got five great pizza and mandra. Now when the crawler crawls the link, it reads more for the first one, and then the second one it reads pizza and mandra. So basically my first signpost actually has no contextual value at all. I'm just telling the search engine more. And what's it going to, it can't really take anything from that. In the second one, it sees Pizza and Mandra, so then it has context to go, well, the web page at the other end must be about Pizza and Mandra rather than more. So this would be a bad one, and this would be a good, a good sort of anthem. We call these anthems. But when you link from page to page, you need to mark it up so that you're giving clear signposts to the search engine what your content is. So when people that, so from a navigational perspective, it's good for the user, because the user can obviously know what the content is, but also from a search engine perspective, when it crawls the link, it understands what the web page is going to be about. So navigational links should follow your content structure as well as carry the context to the content you want to, uh, that you want to rank it for. Okay? So that's um, that's making the site um, that's that's making uh, organizing sorry your information. So that's getting it organized. We talked about the information as well. Now you've got to make your information useful. Now this is pretty simple. You've just got to create content that is useful. If you're creating content for the sake of content, it's not going to work. You have to create the right content and make it useful for your users. Content is not only text, it's all the different types of content you can create. So don't limit yourself just to text. Um, if users find your content useful, then Google will find that and understand that. So think about the user, think about what content they want, and give them the content in the format and in the ways that they want to um, take it. Now, Google is essentially an intent engine. It's been um, closest thing to a mind reader. It essentially um, delivers the content in real time based upon what the user's intent is. And the user says, well, I want this, and Google gives it to them. So it's really important that when you create your content, it answers the user's intent. So you need to understand the user's intent. So here's an example. Cameras. This has so many different intents behind it, and your content cannot possibly answer all of those intents. So just an example. The user could be researching to buy a camera. They could want to know how a camera works, they want to know the history of a camera, or the definition of a camera. Uh, the user may want to know the types of cameras there are. They could be looking for images or video of a camera. It could be any one of these, but you do not know that. The user, the user has his intent, which is putting that simple keyword cameras. But the thing is, if you do not answer his intent, he might be looking for was the camera in McDonald's actually working. You don't know that. If your content doesn't have that in it, he's going to bounce out and go away. So your content, you've got to think about what's the intent of the user. And the intent of the user is going to be very different for every single keyword that you, you have. So someone was talking to me about mutual funds the other day. The keyword mutual funds has actually a lot of intent to it. Someone could be looking to buy it, could be looking to research what a mutual fund is. There's a hell of a lot of people who have absolutely no idea what a mutual fund is. And all they see on the streets is mutual fund, mutual fund, mutual fund, mutual fund. So 90% of them don't even have a clue what they are. And they're coming just to find out what it is. So when your content, when you create a page, your page needs to try and answer those intents. So you've got to know, well, do you want to buy it? Or do you want to know what they are? 
And so you need to actually put that on the page. Otherwise, you're only catering for one half of the people who are coming to the page. Because then the other half are going to come and go, well, I don't want to buy, I don't know what it is. So they're going to disappear. Whereas the guys who don't want it, they say, do you get what I mean? You need to actually put both sets of content on, on the page um, to, to answer both of those intents. So think what is, what's the user going after, and then you've got to create the content accordingly. So will your content actually answer all these intents? Probably, probably not. And this is why you get a bounce rate. Because people are coming to the page, the people who, you, who you've answered the intent for stay there. The people who haven't you answered the intent for go away. So try and think, and if, you're, and if you're thinking about the user, then it helps you to develop and improve your content. So bounce rates become very important. It's a very strong sign that a web page did not answer user intent. And it's a very simple one for Google to use to understand that your content is not usable for a keyword. If you keep, keep bouncing, yep. What's the good benchmark? Okay, so there isn't a good benchmark. It's dependent on the industry and the keyword, right? So, and it's all relative to everyone else in the playing field. So, so for example, um, a lot of the PPC campaigns for loans or for, uh, for car insurance, they're all lead-based forms. I don't know if any of you have ever searched for car insurance and clicked. You just get a lead-based form, right? Now, if you as a user do not want to give a lead, you just bounce. But if you as a user want to give a lead, maybe 25% of you are happy to give a lead, then you'll fill in that lead form. Now, every single person is doing exactly the same thing. So everyone's going to have a very high bounce rate. So it's all going to be relative to each other in the way that, that content is. So, so it's really dependent on, on, on a keyword by keyword basis. But ideally, you obviously want to have the lowest possible bounce rate there is. Um, and if, 50%, so, like I said, it's really dependent on what, what it is you're trying to do. But if you see that a particular keyword has an 80, 90% bounce rate and everything else has got 30, then you've got a problem with that keyword. Um, no, but bounce rate is given at the page level, right? Yes, at the page level, right. But you can see a particular keyword, you can see the bounce rates of particular keywords. So it's not at the page level, it's just kind of, you can see bounce rates of a page, but you can also see the keywords that come to that page, how they're bouncing. So I can see that. I've got, I've got two keywords, I've got mutual fund, and I've got what is a mutual fund. Mutual fund, I get 30% engagement, and what is a mutual fund, I get 80%, uh, I get sort of 80% uh, bouncing. Then I know that my page is not answering what is a mutual fund, but it is answering mutual, mutual funds. So you, you'll get those intricacies between the different keywords. So it's optimizing those different keywords, working out what the intent is of the user, make sure your content maps that. But, it, but Google looks at the bounce rate on an aggregated level against all the competitors in that space. So if everyone has a high bounce rate, then your bounce, and your, so your bounce is 85 and everyone else has got 90, then great, yours is great. <laughs> but it, 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 in, a, in a relative scale, it's not against everything else, right? Um, so first impressions count. You've got literally two seconds to engage the user and make sure that you answer his intent. So how do you so if I come in for a particular keyword, the reason I clicked on your ad is because you have a keyword in the app, but the reason I'm going to stay on your page is that you've also got the keyword right in my face on the page. If I can see the keyword, then I'm going to, oh, this is the page I'm looking for. If I don't see the keyword, I'm going to back it straight out. Yeah? So it's making sure, make sure you engage the user. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by a bounce? Like, suppose, for example, when, I, when I, I have done a search, and uh, there are two ways I can go to that page. One is open it in a new window, or yeah. I can click and go there. So either way doesn't matter. So in Google, Google owns the page, right? It doesn't matter whether you right-click an open page or whether you click on a page. You, Google still knows you clicked, right? So it doesn't make a difference. Now, if you click and you um, go to that web page and then you just close um, the browser, um, then that's a bounce. Or if you click back, that's also a bounce. Because you didn't go anywhere else on the page. You didn't click or didn't do anything. You didn't engage or, or go anywhere. Okay. So, um, a bounce rate is part of analytics. It's something you have to install an analytics package to understand whether or not people are bouncing or not. Google won't tell you in the first instance. You have to have analytics in place. Um, but, yeah. If I don't use Google Analytics on my site, yep. will Google be able to know whether my yes. page is or not? So, so, I'm a user. I go to Google. I search for uh, mutual fund. I click on the first result. I go to that web page. I don't like it. I come back to Google, click on the second result. I like the second page. Google knows that the user didn't like the first page, but like the second page. They didn't come back after the second click. So automatically, you, you're, you're, you're going to get downgraded if everyone keeps doing it. So Google, every time you interact with Google, Google knows what you're doing. Um, so first impressions, Google, uh, so first, first impressions count. Because Google personalizes the results, you don't get a second chance if, if you don't get, get it right the first time around. So it's important that you, you get, get a click and engage. Uh, web pages therefore have to be crafted to be super fast and clearly map users' intent. 
and this is on a keyword level. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if, if I go to a web page and I do a drop down and click on a result, I'm going to another page. So I'm not bouncing, I've engaged, I've done something. But if I go to the web page, I don't click anywhere, and I close the browser, I go back to Google, click on back on the browser, then I bounce. I didn't do anything. But that's relative, so it's sort of like, I mean, Rebecca gave me an example earlier. People who might be looking for your address um, do a search, and the result says your, your address here. You click on that result, the page has the address, and then you get the address and you click out. You've got, you've got to bounce, but you still answer the user's intent. So, so it's, it's all um, sort of relative to whatever the query is and how the, what, what the intent of the user is. So in some cases, the bounce rate needs to be less than 15%, but in other cases, it could be 95% and still be perfectly uh, acceptable. Uh, so just, you just like you're saying that uh, if you have a keyword, you don't get a second chance in this elaborate. Well, so let's say um, the results come up. People do not engage with you, but they engage with someone else. That guy's going to get the credits for that search. So whenever they come back and do that search again, that guy's going to be higher up and you're not. And if everyone else keeps going and they keep interacting with other sites, and they're not interacting with your site and they keep bouncing away from your site, then... Even if they have uh, deleted all their previous uh, history and all that? Stuff. So if you're logged into Google, then that, if they remember everything. If you're not logged in, then it go go off the computer. But most people don't know this. In fact, 99% of the world don't know this. So it, they're not going to be deleting cookies. They're not going to be... <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's a back to, the, back to life. So you need to be able to engage people and keep them there and, and answer their questions. Because the next time will be the other guy that actually gets the result. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, are exit pop-ups good for SEO or back for SEO? Uh, exit pop-ups, what do you mean by that? <coughs> so if someone it clicks, closes the browser and you pop up. Yes. Yeah, Google doesn't typically like that. and normally really use it's really. But um, uh, it's... If you have, um, if you do not allow users to click back to Google, um, then that people, they will penalise you for that. You have a, a big problem on your hands. So, um, pop over or pop under is fine. It's another window. But if you stop the browser from clicking back to Google, then that's a that's a problem. That will cause problems for you. Um, search engines need the content, so you've got to cut the crap out. So when we talk about super fast. Basically, there's two types of things in a web page. There's code, and then there's content. Google, all he cares about is the uh, content. He does not care about all the wizzy band code. Now, when you build a page, you can either code it all into the page, or you can externalize your code and put it elsewhere. So when, um, so when the page downloads, it's just actually the content that gets downloaded. So when you're trying to make quick pages, you need to get the code out of the page and just try and keep the text there. Um, the things that you would do with merging your CSS and JavaScript graphs and making images CSS gross, so they get called in by CSS. Then you want to have kind of caching control and e-tags. So caching control is essentially, I'm a user, I come to your website, when I see the first page, I download all the elements of the page, so like the logo, your JavaScript, and everything like that. Um, if I cache all of that, when I go to the next page, I don't need to download all those elements again because they're cached in my uh, cache there. So it, the second page, third page, much, much quicker to navigate through. If you do not enable your caching, every time I go from page to page to page, I have to download everything every time. And because I'm having to download everything, I'm taking 10 seconds to download the first page, 10 seconds to download the second page. But when I cache everything, well, I'm going to take 10 seconds to download the first page. When I come to the second page, it takes me half a second because it's only downloading the content and nothing else. So uh, I mean, doing things like that really improves speed. Um, also compression. So you can compress your files um, like, a, like a zip file. And so when it gets given to the browser, the browser actually decompresses it. And compression will compress things by uh, 60 to 70%. So one thing you want to do is check with your developers and ask them, have you compressed my files with Gzip? If they haven't, make them do it. It's a very easy thing for them to do. And it'll make your site 60 to 70% faster just by doing that one thing. Um, so pages on usability. At the end of the day, usability is, 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 is a touchy feely thing, but what you've got to do is give the user what he wants and answer his intent. And if you don't do that, you'll, you'll have a bad user experience. You've got to do this in the format, um, in the way he wants and how he wants, uh, and you've got to give clear signposts for the user to do what you want them to do next. Now, if you want the user to, to sign up for something, or you want the user to download something, or you want the user to go to the next page, you have got to tell the user in big, clear, plain writing, this way, do this, do that. Can't hide a little text box somewhere down on the page. You've got to, you've got to actually be upfront in his face if you want them to do something. So 
So the more upfront you are, the more uh, the easier it is for users to engage and go to the next stage. Uh, if they click and engage, you've somewhat succeeded in answering that intent. So give the information, all the answers, that um, in, a, in a logical, clear fashion uh, that the users can easily navigate and understand. So and think about all those intents that you might have and give them all of the answers there on the page so they can choose the one that they want to go there. Breadcrumb path, everything. Make sure uh, you, uh, you, you, you give clear kind of breadcrumb navigation which will allow the users to follow. Um, so links. Now, everyone talks about links. At the end of the day, links must be useful. If it's not a useful link, it's just a link for a sake of being a link, it's bad. Google will penalize you and, and not ignore that link. So links should be written within context, they should be relevant, they should come from sites that are relevant to you. They should lead users to relevant information, navigate users to the next phases. Uh, they should come from good quality content, they should endorse the content, they should give value to the content. Uh, and probably they've got to be useful to the user. If it's just a link just stuck there for the hell of it, and it's not giving any value to the user, then it's a bad link. Um, if they're not useful, they're going to be spam, and then Google will delete them and, and not give any credit for them. Um, this is a bit grey, but having links on separate class C subnets, so on different servers, uh, that carry a lot of page rank, um, and you want to have links that are a few links leaving the page, so, so it's certainly you want to have so the link coming to you is the most authoritative link. Uh, they should always carry anchor text, so they're well time and not be in the footers of pages. They should try and get them into body content or navigational structures. But, uh, some little helpful hints. Clickability, so good gauge whether or not you're good or not, is whether or not you're being clicked on. Um, if you're not being clicked on, what's Google going to think? Useless, right? If you're not getting clicked on. Um, metadata. Metadata is effectively your, um, your advertising message to the user. It's what's going to get people to click on you. Um, it's the only tool you actually have to sell your content. And you've got a very small amount of space to do it in, so it's got to be concise. Point and have a reason for the user to click on you rather than the other guy. So look at the competition's content, see what they're saying, see what their product positioning is, and can you position yourself differently or give a reason for the user to click on you rather than them? Um, so Google's been mapping the CTR for a very long time in AdWords. You can't uh, expect them not to be using it in, in SEO, they definitely are. Um, and so the other thing, they're not thinking about keyword spamming. So don't put keyword, 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 keyword. Be concise, be to the point. Think usability, think what's the user need to see and get, get the user through to the page. <coughs> so social media is a very useful thing indeed. Now, um, Google's been using social media for quite some time to try and gauge the, um, how useful content is. You've got to think of it, think of it like this. Um, <coughs> Everyone understands that links are one way of getting results in Google. So all these SEO companies are doing building links, building, 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 building links. And Google's getting kind of a bit, bit fed up with the fact that all these people are building links and trying to break the system. So they're using other kind of um, signals to determine whether or not content is good. And a very good signal is a social media signal. Because you cannot fake humans. Like you need to have a person to actually endorse something, like something, and, and, and actually give the credibility through. So it's a very good method to actually get kind of humans to actually start endorse content. And it's, social media actually gives you this. So social interactions such as likes, tweets, shares, um, reviews, those sorts of things, Google gives a lot of weight to because it's actually humans and people giving, giving um, endorsements rather than links doing the endorsements. Because I can fabricate, fabricate links. We can create links, right? Um, but we can't fabricate people and getting true endorsements. To people. Sure, but if I build a million profiles on Facebook that like a page, my profiles won't have any friends. They won't be real profiles. So when the search engine comes to look at it, it will notice that, well, that's not a, that's a fake profile, that's a fake profile. So you can't, you, you have to create content on these profiles. You've actually got to, they've got to be people on these profiles. Um, if, if the likes and like not that, they, there's influences, right? So if I'm a person who has 50,000 followers and I say that I like something, I, I can't make 50,000 followers out of nothing, you know, and those followers can't be made um, fake. You, to do that, there's a huge amount of effort to create all of these fake profiles that are constantly updating content and creating friends and creating this sort of thing. And then Facebook um, and Twitter and all these things are all, they're working very hard to stop that sort of activity happening. Now, admittedly, you can go and buy friends. I, I've seen companies trying to sell me friends for two rupees of friends, and they'll give me 20,000 and then another time. But they're not real people, so what's the point? 
is they're not going to interact with my brand. They're not actually going to do anything. They're not going to, they're not going to interact. And search engine sees that as well. So it looks at the, the, the links of the people who are actually following. It's not just the fact that you've got 50,000 followers uh, liking the content. It's who are these people? Are they actually real? Are they generating content? Are they interacting with other people? Are they doing stuff? Are they active kind of profiles? So let me give you an example. Uh, you know, social media actually has prevented uh, likes on the internet. You know, there should be this cartoon, famous internet cartoon that when a dog is chatting on the internet and says, on the internet, nobody knows I'm a dog. But the fact of the matter is, now on social media, if you have a dog, people will know you're a dog. So let me give you an example. Uh, you know, what happened was when I made a Facebook account about seven, eight years back, or I don't know when, you know, those days we used to fill up the forms and make things, so enter, 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 enter. It was first jam, whatever date, I would just make it and make it an account. I would not go through the details and fill up accurate information. Suddenly, few years down the line, suddenly one day I got up and like there are 585 people wishing me happy birthday. And I, I said like, what the heck, what happened? Where did this come from? I need phone calls, this message, etc. And then I'm, I reflect, it's like, this is on my birthday. He said, no, it is. Facebook says so. I said, I know my birthday, or Facebook does it. <laughs> and then I had to go back to Facebook and actually change a very basic thing, just like a birthday, because otherwise you have all these likes and this coming in, right? So that means just even a simple thing that a birthday I have to go and correct. So imagine that putting any false information on social media is actually not increasingly difficult. If I say I've got a Ferrari and I have not, then like there's be some of my friends who call call that lie out very quickly, right? So it's very difficult for now to people say anything on social media which is not the truth. And which is a very, very important thing. A lot of people think that Oh, social media is there to be just that. It's not. Actually, social media forces people to take the truth. You can't die on social media, even if it's your birthday. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very different sort of level of endorsement. Now, there was a time that um, uh, that you were able to actually use Twitter to span the system. And SEO Mods did a lot of investigations about three years ago that actually found that Google was using Twitter likes, uh, Twitter sort of retweets and tweets as well as likes as a ranking factor. And they did a whole lot of tests and actually proved that they could get things ranking through through social interactions. Um, Google obviously denied this because they don't like people breaking their stuff. So, um, but what, what, was, what was true with that whole thing is when they had a Twitter feed, you were able to put a piece of content up, tweet it, and then get it retweeted about 10 times. That piece of content would appear in Google instantly, and you could see it there um, in the results. So spammers were just uh, making um, What's, what's the making gravy while there's hay or something like that? Making, <laughs> making hay while there's sunshine. Making hay while there's sunshine and spamming the system massively. So they were using Twitter to get these, get these results. Um, so the, the kind of integration of social so has become quite a big uh, part of it. Um, if you don't think of it principally, uh, what would be better than uh, for Google than an actual person endorsing content? So if, if, if what would be better for them is if you ask to own the person. Okay? So in comes. Google Plus. Google Plus now have the ability to see all of the intricacies and actually the endorsements and everything like that. They've got the social platform itself. Now, the thing with Google Plus is like they tried to integrate with Facebook and Twitter. They asked them. Facebook, and Facebook flatly said, go away. They're probably in much ruder terms than the way I just said. But the, and Twitter, Twitter broke, uh, broke, broke their contract with Google as well. So Google essentially um, went and did a loan. So in comes Google Plus. Now, through Google Plus, Google can deliver 100 times better results because they know you, they know your friends, they know what you like and what you don't like. Because they know all that stuff, they can advertise to you much more effectively. Think of all the things you put into social platforms. And the other thing is, if Google actually owns the platform, they can tell whether or not these things are spam or not, because they all come from the same IP, they'll be the same people doing it, they'll see the kind of interest. But at the end of the day, if you're not the kind of the man in the middle of all of this, if you're not the most popular guy in town for your content, then you'll start um, losing ranks and you won't get those kind of engagements. So can you spam it? It's not possible. Google controls people, they control the content, they control the internet, the intricacies of the connection, the IPs, the users, the types and places. They understand all of that. They can see perfectly well whether or not you're trying to gain their system. So it takes it to a whole other level. The final piece is Google's mission statement, universal accessibility. Now, Universal accessibility, if we can take this seriously, it means content being accessed by anyone, anyhow, anywhere. Now, Google's broadened its reach already to mobile, social media, uh, it won't be long until we get Google TV. But at the end of the day, could argue YouTube is already doing that. Okay? 
So the future really is, if, if Google are going universal, you've got to think, well, I've actually got to get universal as well. If I want my content found, I've got to be on mobile platforms. I've got to be on, on um, TV. I'll, I'll be on your watch at some point. And you've got to start moving the time and creating the right content for these different platforms. So is your content universally accessible? Probably not. So mobile being the obvious one, huge growth area, everyone's talking about it. Handsets, 3,000 rupees, gets you on the internet, very cheap data plans. Most of the people coming onto the internet in the next few years are never going to taste the internet apart from being on a handset. So suddenly you've got to kind of think, well, oh, I've actually got to get myself online through for a mobile platform. So how do you do that? Again, simple. Just organize yourself, get, make yourself useful and accessible, um, and, and make, make the information. And then you'll follow, you'll follow the mission, right? So create <laughs> sites that functionally, uh, effectively on multiple platforms. So think Blackberry, think iPhone, think the different handsets. And you can actually do some quite clever sort of targeting. If you know your audience is going to be on a particular handset, so let's say you want to reach out to the masses, they're all going to be on the very cheap handsets. So optimize your site for the very cheap handsets, so they're functions of this. So then you're reaching out to your right target audience. If you want to target the very rich people, optimize your site for a Galaxy Tab or an, I an iPhone. Or so you can actually do some quite clever sort of targeting of the right audiences for yourself if you optimize your site for the right sort of platform. But you need to organize your content much the same way as you organize your main site. You need to optimize the user experience, simplify things, and give the consumers what they want. So tips and tricks, design content that's navigatable, engages on small screens, you've got to keep it very light, shy away from heavy images and the like. Link mobile content to mobile content, so get endorsements from other mobile platforms. Uh, link directly from your own website, mobile website. Uh, use HTML5, which is a multi-platform based technology, which will allow your content to be shown on lots of different platforms. Uh, use standard name conventions, so the search engines understand it's mobile content. So there's mdot, mobile or a folder the same mobile. <coughs> build, build the unique operating system, so make sure your content actually works on the operating system. Uh, and use redirects to mobile agents, so if someone comes to your website from a mobile agent, you automatically redirect them to your mobile platform. So you make sure whatever you do to a, a user, you do to Google as well. So if you're going to put a video on, on, a, on a mobile and I've got a, a very slow connection yeah, and I'm using a BlackBerry. Probably not on mobile, maybe from a general perspective. So on, on a website it's fine, but don't, when, when the web page loads up, don't load the video into the web page. Make sure the video um, loads on the clip. So when I'm downloading the web page, I'm not downloading the video, I'm just downloading the web page. And when, it, when the user does an action, then the video loads. Otherwise, otherwise it's, it's, uh, you're going to get a huge amount of data on there. Um, for, video, for mobile, video is not very good unless the guy's got a good 3G uh, connection and they've got a decent platform to use it on. So you, if you're going to go after the masses on the cheap phones, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use video content. I'd keep it light. <coughs> so web presence optimization could be construed as universal accessibility. At the end of the day, can you be found on other platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter? Are you optimizing your content so that when people search on Facebook for your products and services, that your, your page actually comes up. So simple things like making sure your titles carry the keywords, or your descriptions carry the keywords. Um, making sure that the right word, words you want to be found for is within the context on these platforms. And then aggregating that content out so people engage with it and like it, share it and all that. So they go to ask yourself, are you there? Probably not, but it's not too difficult to get yourself on, on these platforms. <coughs> so in conclusion, uh, if you're not sure about something, you've just got to ask yourself, does this make my information organized, universally accessible, and useful? If the answer is yes, then go and do it. Um, does it, uh, so I was just thinking about localization and internationalization of your uh, content. Sure. Uh, would you rather have, like, so firstly, would Google do it separately uh, in terms of content that the person searching from? So the way the way the localization works, um, there's the first pointer, which is your domain extension. So the top level domain, if you've got a .com, you're basically telling the world that you're a global entity, you're a .com. If you've got a do, do .co .in uh, or .in, your automatically default setting will be Indian. So it will only show up in Indian results. If you want your site to actually be a global site and you're keeping a .co .in or a .in, you need to go to Google and say you're actually a global entity and uh, that is the domain names, and I guess I'm now asking more about the uh, language of the content. The content itself, right. So, so um, again,
again, what you need to do is structure your content. So if you have French content, you have Japanese content, you've got English content, you need to structure it into folders and say, this is my French content, this is my Japanese content, this is my English content. You then need to tell Google and create profiles in Webmaster Tools for France, all the French-speaking countries, so where it's wherever you want that content to be shown. And you need to tell Google, this is, this is a French, this is French content for these markets. This is English content for this market. This is Japanese content for this market. So my question is, so if the URLs are different, if I've done this as well, Google's still accumulating my search rank for the same page, same content together, or am I getting different? You're getting different, you're getting different um, results from each, but you can do, so let's say I've, I've written something in English, and I've directly translated it into French. Now Google will actually take that as um, duplication. So what you need to do also is you need to tell Google, uh, you need to give Google a categorization tag, which is a language specific one, to say, this is a duplication of the English version. Or, or whichever page you want to be most prominent. But what it does is it then goes, okay, fine, it's all the same content, but if someone searches in French, I'm going to show them the French result. If someone searches in English, I'll show them the English result. So it will start determining which piece of content to show. But you need to mark the content up accordingly to tell the search engine, well, this is French, that's English, and so on and so forth. And I, my question is uh, for mobile, is Google doing uh, rankings differently for SEO? Yeah, so th it does it on the on the platform basis. So you'll get a different ranking on an iPhone to, to the iPad to everything. But in, in India, no, they, they know this, they're not getting those rankings happening because there's not no one's actually building these, these content sites and actually creating the sites. So it hasn't got to that point yet. But if you're in the, like, the US or UK, you'll get a very different set of results on your different handsets based upon uh, what handset you're actually using. And is it the handset or is it the browser? So the yeah, hand that brand set will look like the browser, the search engine will know it's a Blackberry, whatever, it will know it's an iPhone, because it will have that, that user agent on. So, and, and it will see the interactions as well, so it will see this website works very well on Blackberry, but it doesn't work very well on an iPhone. So on, when someone searches on Blackberry, I'll rank it high, and when someone searches on an iPhone, I'll rank it low, because it doesn't work as well as other sites. So you've got to actually start thinking of platform specific. Uh, there's technologies like HTML5, which allow your content to render across multiple platforms, uh, so if you build an HTML5 site and you make it very simple and, and straightforward, then it will work nicely on, on lots of different mobile platforms. Then we need to start in the audience. Uh, That means there's a redirection in place, which is a good thing. That's a good thing to have because you're, you're only presenting to the search engine one version of the site. If it resolves that you actually get go, uh, gomolo.com uh, without a W, without a W, then that's a problem because you've got two versions of the site. Now, there's different types of redirections. There's a, there's, there's a permanent redirection and there's a temporary redirection. So the next thing I do is if you do redirect, that's a good thing because someone's doing the right thing. But um, there's different types of redirections. There's something called a permanent one and a temporary one. If you temporarily redirect, it means that the value of the, of the page is not passing. It's, it's, only, it's temporarily held at the old location. Whereas if you have a permanent redirect, the value passes from one location to another. So the next thing I would check is just to check whether or not the redirection is a temporary one or a permanent one. Which is here, it says 301 permanently moved. So when it jumps from one to the other, it's a permanent redirection, which is again a good thing. So this this site has, has got the kind of a very basic uh, piece to put in play. So this website is called Internet Officer. It's got lots of lovely little tools that are all free. Uh, so there's a redirect checker on here. You just put your URL in, and it does does the redirect check. So it's down here. So uh, where is it? Redirect checker here. It's got lots of little tools built in. It's a, it's a good little free site. Uh, Okay, next thing I'm going to look at is this. So
So my page title, Bollywood Hindi Movie, is the keyword that we have chosen for our title. Latest movies releases, release, review and news, actor, actresses, actress photo pics and video games. So it's a bit of a kind of spammy title if you ask me. It's got lots of things just chucked into it. Um, and it's not that kind of concise as to where it is. But the thing that I'm, I'm looking at is I put the first keyword into here, so Bollywood Hindi Movies, and I found that the site doesn't rank. Okay, so even though we've got it in the title, we're getting no, no rankings for that. Now, when you actually look at the web page itself, look. If I look at the Bollywood Hindi movies, I'm just going to see if I can find it. Bollywood Hindi movies. Okay, so. Is that right? Yeah. So it's there, but it's as a link. And it's got two links. Okay. There's no physical content on this web page that carries that title. So Google's like, okay, fine, the title says that, but it's not on the web page. So why, why, why would I rank you for it? Okay, what's the point? So you've got a title that says one thing, you've got a web page that says something completely different. Now your links, um, links do not carry content. Links are treated differently to content. So a link will be treated as a link, and content is treated as a content. So um, links, even though it's in the links, it's not in the content of the page. So Google's going to be like, well, I'm not ranking this page. So whatever you put in your title, you can't just chuck a keyword in and expect it to rank. You need to have that context in the page itself as well. The other thing is, is this web page is quite nicely marked up. Now this is a tool, it's called SEO X-Ray. So if you go and search on Google for SEO X-Ray, it's a free tool. Um, if I click on this, it shows me all the markup in the page. So there's things like there's a H1, there's a H2, there's a H3. These are, these are content titles and elements, right? Now every single page should have what we call a H1. You can have multiple H2s, multiple H3s, multiple H4s, but you have a single H1. Now what I've looked at in this page, it doesn't have a H1. So that when the crawler comes to the page and reads all the content, it doesn't know what the web page is about because it's got hundreds of H2s, which are all different titles. And it has no fixed point to say, well, this web page is about this. Now, my title says one thing. My web page doesn't even carry that context. And the page itself doesn't even have a title. So the search engine has absolutely no idea what the web page is about. It's got, and, and so it won't be able to really determine what, whether it should rank for this, 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 this. So, um, so it's another thing. If you want a page to rank, you need to make sure that whatever you put in your title, you're replicating on the page, you're putting content to, to reinforce that. Uh, in the page. If you don't have the content in the page, you can't, you can't get a particularly rank. So that's why, when I come here... Sorry, if you're going to subscribe, I'm going to look at it. Where have you got H from? So there's, they're, they're, they're basically markup. So H, they're called H tags. Now, if you don't have the tool, you can look at the source of the page itself. So if I go to these tools... No, you must have a personal tool name itself. So, so the, the, the tool is... Um, uh, SEO. SEO, so thank you, yeah. So it's SEO X-Ray, it's a free tool. Um, it's actually called SEO for Firefox. You have to register with the guys who built it, but then you can download it, and it's a free plugin into Firefox, okay? Um, but when you're actually in the code, all it's doing is just marking up the elements. So when I type in H1, it shows me there's no H1 in the page. When I type in H2, it gives me the H2. So you see here, H2 class. The class is just simply the way it looks, but the H2 is there, so, and that, that is a H2. So, you can see the H2s, H2s, and everything like that, they're, they're title markups. So they tell the search engine, this is the title, this is the subtitle, this is the subtitle. So this page is, is, is confused, essentially. It, doesn't, it, it has a title which has got a lot of words in it, and those words are not reflected back in the page itself. Uh, and, and the page itself doesn't have that much of It's got some good content in it, but this is duplicated content from other pages in the site. So there's not much content on this page which is unique to the page, apart from this. Um, I'm assuming this is unique to this page, but I might be wrong. Let's have a look. Now, when you have content duplication within your own site, Google will only credit one of the pages within your site with that content. So if, you've got, if your homepage is pulling in content from lots of different sources from around your site, it could be that your homepage doesn't actually rank, and rank for that content. It will be the page that it pulls it from that will actually rank for the content. So if you have no unique content on the page itself, then the page itself can't rank for anything. So just looking at this, I can see that these are blocks of content that are pulled from other pages in the site. So they, this is not the page that we rank for this content, it'll be the other pages that rank for it. So if I want this page to rank for it, I need everything unique. And this block of content here 
is a unique block of content, well, it is a piece of content, I'm just going to check if it's unique. So if you want to see if something's unique or not, and see if someone's copied your content, or you've got duplication within your own site, put it in an inverted comma into the Google box, paste your content, and then close it off in the inverted comma, and then Google will search exactly for that piece of content. So you see here, your piece of content that you've got on the homepage is duplicated eight times across the site. So only one of those pages is going to take the actual credibility of that piece of content. Okay, and the page that's been given the credibility is the home page. So the home page is going to be the one that ranks for you. Okay? But the home page itself, so it's important that you don't duplicate across your site, and it's important you have unique content within pages if you want that page to actually rank for things. Um, okay, so that's a quick blitz of that one. I'm going to do another one now. No, and I think one thing to add out here is that, see, you have to decide which keyword you want to rank for. If you look at your home page, your biggest important thing, even though it's an H2, it says photos and videos. Now, that's not even relevant to your industry. Every should have said movie photos and videos, Hollywood photos and videos, Bollywood photos and videos. At least something relates to movies, right? Because the, the only title that I see as a user is photos and videos. That means there is no way you're targeting the basic intent the user has. At least you are about movies, but where in this page does it say anything? I don't see the word movie itself mentioned in the content of the website. So I think the most important thing is that whatever your target audience is, at least imagine if they go to Google and search for something and they land up on your site, the intent has to be mapped and the send has to be carried. As I say, if you lose the user there itself, I'm searching for Bollywood movies, I come to this home page, I photo the videos, I don't even know that it's about other things in the movie, also just photo the videos. And go back from here, the Google will be in place. You haven't have reinforced the message. You were talking about photos and videos, but your ad talks about Bollywood movies. Um, okay, so just going to do another one. Uh, just two, six. So, again, uh, I'm going to do main, which is live in art. Live in art. Co. So, we're waiting for that to load up. Okay. Okay, so this one. As, did you see what happened there? You see it went from livingart.coi and it jumps, it index.php forward slash customers, blah, blah, blah. The URL has changed. So there's a redirection going on. First thing to notice is that it's, it didn't redirect to a www. So that is a probable, a very high chance that I have this page, and I also have, let's have a look, www. this page. <coughs> Ah, no, we don't. Okay, cool. So they, they've redirected one version back to another version. So it's only given me, given me one version of the page. But there's still a redirect going on. So I need to check this redirect and see if it's a correct redirect or not. So I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to check it. See what we get. Which is good. Okay, so this is again a randomly moved redirection. But this is a horrible, horrible URL to redirect to redirect your domain name to. It's, you're taking your domain and you're putting it right down to the fourth or fifth level. You should always, where possible, have at the very top level for your domain, www or whatever, uh, yourdomain.com and leave it at that, rather than send it all the way to four levels deep within the site. We're talking about that structuring of content. Your structure starts at the fifth level within your site. So there's a folder within a folder within a folder within a folder within a folder before you actually can get to your content. So, so and you, you kind of, you, so you automatically put yourself on the back foot. Um, so, just looking at the page itself, let's just go through a bit of extra rang of this one. So, we have absolutely no content marker. So, the search engine has, at least the other side have a little bit of something going on. We're telling the search engine we've got these bits and pieces. Here, we've got no markup at all. So, there's, there's nothing for the search engine to work on. Um, the other thing to look at here is the only content you've got on the page is this block of content here. And that's about it. That's it. So I've got, so I can rank this page for exactly 10 words or something like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. So it's 10, options, 10 words I could possibly rank the page, which is not many. Um, the title of my page says customer login, right? Now, I'd be surprised if this even ranks for your, for your rank. Hang on, for your brand. Let's have a look. 
Oh, it does. Uh, Google's very kind. It's actually rewritten your title for you. Okay. <laughs> so you see, it's rewritten re 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 your living the art five. It's rewritten its, its title for you. Um, oh, it's not the same one. Oh, 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 oh. I've been too nice to you. No, it doesn't rank. So it doesn't even rank for your own thing, right? Now, sorry, I stand correctly. Now the reason for that is your homepage says customer login. Just imagine how many websites on the web have the page type of customer login. I cannot imagine. Now you are probably one of the only people who have living R, but you haven't even said to the Google living R. Your web page content, does that mention living R? No. Uh, and there's no other mention of living art anywhere on the page. So you can't even possibly rank your own brand to them, let alone, so if someone's looking for you, they can't find you, let alone kind of a product place to turn around in. So this one's in a very sorry state of affairs, I have to say, sorry. Um, so I think, I think the number of requests are going down as we do. <laughs> 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 um, OK. Uh, just, a little nice thing. I'll show you with Jesse Kessio because we talked about that earlier. Okay, this. Google itself doesn't have any content on its page. Sorry? Google itself doesn't need SEO. So Google doesn't really need SEO because uh, it's Google, I guess. But Google, in terms of backlinks, have so. They've got up in the gazillions of backlinks. And all the backlinks say Google, 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 Google. So Google didn't rank for Google in a bit of a trust. So Google, you have to go to Google. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is an example, like a lot of the other examples like this exception, right? So you take 100 people, put them on a busy highway, blindfold them, and all of them should run, right? And then you make an example of one guy who reached. He says, see, this guy reached. What's the problem? What about the next 99 who died and finished on the highway? <laughs> right? So always taking that one example that doesn't follow the rule is easy. But the, the, what we are trying to do is we are trying to get you across the highway and just start by chance. <laughs> by <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to do this is Majestic SEO. This, this is a very nice thing. It's a quick kind of diagnostic kit of all your backlinks. So I'm just going to show you backlink history. So this will show me all the links that go to this website. So you've got lit in art.co.in um, They're closed, I mean, they're closed. They're closed, so there won't be any links going to it. So to try and get it ranking in, in this would be a very difficult thing, but let's have a look. So, wow, brilliant. So we have absolutely no links going to this site, so no mentions of it anywhere on the web. So Google has absolutely nothing to work out what this website's about. It doesn't even have a link to follow to try and work out what the website's about. So for this to rank, it does require quite a lot of, lot of effort. Um, first of all, first things first, whoever owns this site, change the title of your site to represent the name of your site. Second thing, put some content on this page to say that you do, you are living art. And then hopefully you might start ranking for work when people start looking for you. Um, the next thing it would be to start building some links. The other thing is, to get this ranking from an SEO perspective, Every single page of the site behind closed doors. So the search engine has nothing but this page to work on. One page with 10 words on it. Cannot rank, it won't rank for anything. So if you want to get SEO traction with this site, you'll need to develop content uh, which is going to use to rank and grade and associate what your site's about. Otherwise, otherwise what's, it going to, what's it got to go off? You've got to give it a little bit of a you got to give it a little bit of something to try and get it to get it. And, and see, though, in this case, what happens is there are certain sites, like we work with Deeds and You, etc., which have registered users, etc. But if you search for the word Deeds right now, they're ranking number one. So you always then find things that, okay, what are the things content you can give? Suppose you represent five brands. Can you give content on those five brands? There's something that you sell, right, which can be outside the login where the user can at least know what he's going to get. Because just give me a 50% off without telling me what you're going to give me a 50% off on and then hoping for me to register is futile, right? At least tell me that, okay, I'm going to get a 50% off on furnishings for home center or from or whatever the product is. Then I know that, okay, if I register, then this is what I can get. This is just like, when I come here, even though the 50% off is an attractive thing to see, but only if it makes sense if you tell me what I'm going to get a 50% off on. <laughs> That's a, so some of the things, the basic user intent, we will always keep in mind, the user comes there, does he get what your site is about and what is he going to get for the user off on something that he desires? If this is a point, then he's going to go away 
And even if you have SEO right and everything right, but if your page is exactly the same, then you still lose users. So you start getting people, but you still not get memberships. Okay, so this site here, I've just done a search for DTS point. So I've just put that into the browser. So I've got that page is uh, I'm just going to do the same thing again and see what I get. And I also get this page resolving. Okay, so I've got two versions of the site. Okay, but I'm going to say but they put something on here called Economical Tag. So see the little blue thing here. This is this is a little tool that just tells me it's got a Canonical Tag. It tells that this page has been canonically mapped to the non dub dub version. So when Google crawls this page, it's being told that there's a duplication and it needs to go to the other version. So there's two ways of managing domain level uh, discussions. One's with a canonical tag, and the other is with, um, with redirection. So they're, they're using, using canonical tag here. Now when we actually go into here, we'll see it somewhere. We'll see the canonical tag where it is. Uh, I don't see here? Link rel, canonical, href, and there's a reference point back to the other version. So it's basically saying, please ignore this page, treat the other page as the main version. Um, when I go to Google, you see that's the version that indexes. So there's not the www.dot's not there. It's the non dot that's actually there. Another thing you'll notice here is the United States file. So someone has taken the time to go to Webmaster Tools and actually tell Google this is a US-based website. This is for US uh, people. So that's what the, the uh, United States stands up. Um, just looking at the things, so we've got software and e-commerce solutions for diamonds and jewellery. That is quite a random title. Um, they'd be quite difficult. I, I'd assume here that your consumers, or oh, maybe they would, but, soft, but the, the keywords that the consumers use might not necessarily be these words that we put into this title. Um, they, we, they require a little bit of research, especially some jewelry website design, okay? online diamond jewelry inventory software for independent retail domain reference. So the description is pretty nice and tidy. It tells us exactly what's going on. Um, page itself, so I'm just going to look at this. So we've, the title we've made is Software and E-commerce Solutions for Diamond and Jewelry. So uh, you want to have, what sort of keyword might we use? So let's, let's just have a look at e-commerce solutions, for example. So it's an e-commerce. Okay, good. So what is written in the title has been duplicated on, on the page itself. So if we were to search these things, this would come up. So hopefully, let's just prove that theory, right? Let's have a look. So if we put the, the word in our title, we put the word in the title of the page as well, and there we go, we come up number one. So it, it does work in that sense. So we put things in the right places. So um, this is quite a unique sort of string to be found for, and it might not necessarily be the keywords that your consumers might use to find you. That I think that needs more uh, research into this, because that's a very kind of particular sort of statement that they've been placed there. Um, but the one thing that is good is that at least, the, at least it, it's, it's married up. I'm just going to check whether we correctly marked this up. So let's have a look. So there we go, H1. So Google's been told that that's your title, and that's your subtitles and everything like that. So this page is nicely put together from a search engine's perspective, because it, it, you're telling search engine that's it. My only query with this would be, has the key, are we chosen the right words for the, for the users of, of the site? Um, in terms of the, uh, this is navigation very nice. Then I think one thing that we can do is like the, just look at analytics and see which are the kind of keywords that are giving you best traction. The other thing what you can do is if you go to Google Traffic Estimator and the PPC tool that uh, we must have shown you, where you can put a keyword in the PPC, the, the, the Traffic Estimator tool of Google, see what is the keyword that has maximum volume. And then you can map the intent and you know that okay, this word people are searching for, they mean they were searching for us. And this keyword has the maximum volume, we could put that as a title. Because not only will give you a lot more traffic, give you rank for it, plus give the right target audience for you. Okay. 
Um, I found it kind of okay. uh, Do you have another question? See, the thing is, that's what I think the key question out here is very simple, right? Uh, there are 200 factors that influence SEO. What happens is that we take one guy who reached the other side of the highway and the thing that it's okay to do that. The thing is that Flipkart would have more than a million pages in their content. The entire hierarchy is reading up to the top page. They would have more than a million, two million backlinks coming to them. They are the largest site in the country. So if you had 2 million pages in your website, you had all this content and then you structured it the way they instructed it, you rank for 500,000 keywords. So you are not a 2 million page website. Right? Any smaller company would also, if it is in business of e-commerce selling product, it would just simply list the product. Well, that's what I'm saying. So let's say if you are an e-commerce company which has 500 products, you will, and those 500 products are not unique, and there are every single other e commerce company is selling 2 million products, which 500 of them are one of them. Then Google is going to give more importance to that company because they have 500 products plus, which you have, plus they've got 2 million other products. So, see, the role of the search engine is to rank the better guy, not to favor the small guy or not to favor the big guy. So, contextually, whoever is more relevant to that search intent, that guy should rank. Just imagine, right? If you search for you know, something to do with online shopping in e-commerce. And the first 20 web results were all SMBs with 50, 100 products each, and Flipkart would not feature out there. Mm -hmm. Would you stop using Google? I guess we would. Yeah. Right? So you want, the reviewers want Flipkart to rank, because they have the content for everybody. But there's a lot of guidelines you can all follow, where at least you beat Flipkart on the keywords that you are more relevant. So you have to identify not the keywords where the keyword is mobile phone, but suppose you have a special offer for a specific product, that also that offer is just only meant for people who are in Nagpur. Then we saying that offer in Nagpur and then ranking for it, and maybe you'll get only 50 visitors from that keyword, but you'll be flipped out on that keyword. So it's very important to you know, assess your resources and then find a battle that you can win. And right, you go on an open field, one to one, Flipkart is going to beat you. Then you have to have that guerrilla tactic that, you know, but I'm not going to try to beat Flipkart on mobile phone keyword. But I'm going to beat Flipkart on these three products. And that's the way a small SMB will have to think, right? Because otherwise, if you're open battle, they've got more resources than you. They have access to companies which you don't have access to. So you can't beat them on an open playground, right? You have to have that, you know, if you've seen a movie 300, <laughs> the same, right? You have to have that lock. Can that you give me an example. Uh, for example, Flipkart is a bigger guy. As oh, give, me a, give me an example of what products do you deal with and what do you do? Well, I'm, uh, I would be launching a, fl a florist website, which would be a pan India delivery network of uh, anything. Oh, yeah, yeah I, we, we did talk. So, see, again, as I said, right? If you don't have any differentiation from the, the flowers.com and you know, flowers.com and fundamentals.com, etc. And you will do exactly what they do. Think about this, your domain name is going to be uh, newer than what theirs is. <coughs> they have a lot of reviews. They've been liking a certain years for a long period of time. They have most of these than what you have. They have the same products that you don't have. Then the top 100 guys who are already ranking right now, how will you convince the search engine that you are an option which is better than some of these guys? That's what I'm asking you. But that's what you can't because you have to create that option first. So the thing is, see, SEO, you can only do if you have a differentiation. So let's say, suppose you sell, you know, 500 rupee bouquets as we talked about, right? So then what happens is, if you want to write for a keyword for expensive bouquets, you know, exclusive expensive bouquets, luxury bouquets, whatever things which are related to 500 rupees plus bouquets, then you know that the other sites of the world are not ranking for that and they're not optimized for that. Then you can have a differentiation and beat them at it. You never want to beat them at flowers. Right? It's futile to start with and say, I'm going to beat flowers.com on flowers, flowers keyword. Right? So you have to find out some differentiation. Such as like in any other business, right? It's a business, you're starting off. If you don't have a differentiation, you just say that, okay, you know, I'm going to do SEO and I'm going to compete with communicate to, I'll just do it better than what they do. It's going to take you time before you gain the same relevancy that we have, right? 
search engines work exactly the same way. You have to convince the search engine that you have an exclusive product differentiated from your competition for this keyword intent, and you are the best guy in the world or in India for that keyword intent. The keyword intent could be anything, as I said, combination of certain flowers, combination of certain things. You know, customized, let's say you have bouquets which are uh, very, very Indian themes, which are regional in nature. So if you're going for a wedding, you're going to a wedding of a certain community, those are flower combinations which would be very, very peculiar for those communities. So you have the most exclusive wedding flowers which are meant uh, are customized for community weddings with the same community. So you have, I don't know what community you see, but there has to be some theme that, see the thing is your product offering has to be differentiated and then any SEO guy can rank you for a keyword that you want to rank for. But at the end of the day, that differentiation is something as a business model, whether it's SEO or your own business in the physical world, you have to have that differentiation. It, otherwise, it's very easy to say, you know, I'm going to build, I'm going to compete with Amazon. I'll just be better than them. But that's not going to be easy, right? So, you have to find a differentiation because we can only rank you for a keyword that you want to rank for. So let's say we work with Hush Babies that focus on baby products. So they're very focused on baby products. There are hundreds and thousands of sites and e-commerce will come up which will compete with Flipkart. So let's say I play table tennis. What if a sports site comes up which has 500 different combinations of products for table tennis? I'm sure that Flipkart will not have 500 products for table tennis. So you have to find your niche. When you say, no, I'm going to do exactly what Flipkart does and beat them, they are building down a company right now here. Yeah. So you have to find a differentiation. So why, why can, let's say, if you just take Flipkart, right? What if I create an a e-commerce site for expensive watches? Every single watch on that site will be more than five libraries. And Flipkart will not sell those watches. They don't have the, that. And there are examples of luxury.com and uh, luxury sites which are focusing on h &I products. But they're still doing e-commerce. But they are focusing on expensive stuff. In the same way, you can actually sell cheaper stuff. Maybe you focus on books which are visual books which cost 20 rupees a book. And that's your target audience. Flipkart doesn't do that. So you can't go head to head with these guys. And in the physical world also, right? You say, boss, I want to compete with lines. Yeah, it's possible you can compete with lines. But you need a different scale of operation to start with. And eventually, 20 years online, you will compete with the lines. Right? So, Search engine's physical world is exactly the same. You have to find the niche, not that I want to be reliance. I want to be reliance in this particular thing. They have reliance fresh in this place. I have a better option of doing this. I do it more effectively and will beat them in that one single place. Not reliance as a group, not reliance as a retail outlet, reliance fresh in this location of this city. You have to start somewhere and beat them there. Right? Then you find investors, then you will get. So let's when we started off, right? We didn't say that we go and compete and beat the best SEO agency in the world. We said, okay, we will focus in this. We built it up over a 15 year period. We we go to the enterprise sector. We become the best that is in the enterprise sector. And see SMBs, right? Uh, if you take there are a lot of companies who are double the size and number of people, and they focus on the SMB market. We don't compete in that space. You know, we recommend people like you to go to them. So even at our level, SEO, we can't do SEO for both. We would love to do it, but we can't. We just don't have the resources and the expertise required to handle that at that price. Then I cannot get Ben and Ronnie and all these people to work for us and service the SME market. It's just not financially viable. Right? So it's very important that differentiation is very, very essential. And that just then just manifests itself in the search engine. So the first thing I ask our partner is, what is the keyword you are dying for? If you just don't know what kind of differentiation you have and you want to write the word flowers, it's not going to make sense for anybody, right? Okay, um, I just want to go back to this one quickly. PTS point, um, there's one thing, you, you've been, content is well marked up to a degree and your interlinking is good. There's lots of good interlinking with lots of good content. But this is a bit of a travesty. 
it looks to me like every single page of your website has exactly the same title. So this is an interior page where at the top you've got software and e-commerce solutions for diamonds and jewelry. That's the same title as your home page, where actually this web page is actually B2B diamond e-commerce. Well, actually, where is it? Uh, where is this web page? So this, this, this is the actual title of the page. So that, that should be the H1 for this page, not the title at the top. Um, it works for the works for the, the home page, but it doesn't work for the interior pages. So just looking at some other pages, hang on a second, I was going to check those as well. Um, so let's try this one. So here's another interior page. Again, the page, you're telling the search engine that that's the title of the page. So all of the pages of your site have exactly the same title, which is not the case. Um, the title is actually this, this H2 that you've got there. So you need to, you need to correctly uh, mark up the right bits of content with the right things. Um, just to think about that Flipkart, Flipkart have, have templated their site for millions of products and it's templated in exactly how it should be templated. They have breadcrumbs, which mar marries the navigation structure. They, um, they have the H1s, they've got H2s, they've got content on the page, they have user reviews, they've got the keywords marked into the right places. So they built in all this, look at all this content just for that one book. There's a whole page of, of content all related to that one book. So there's all these user reviews and everything like that. I can't tell you the value of allowing consumers to come in and create content for you about particular things because that's all fresh and expanding content that the search engine will pick up on and give value to. Also, you see here, this particular book, this one product has a page rank of four down here. The reason this page has got page rank four is they've linked it, they've linked it from their home page. So anything that gets linked from the home page is automatically going to get a lot of value. So if you've got a huge uh, portfolio of products, see here, look, look at the interlinking of this. They've got millions of products, so they need to get the value into lots of deep parts of the site. So there's hundreds of links in this first page, which allows that value to pass through. And all the links carry content. So this is their television page. This is their home theatres page. This is their players' home, uh, home audio page. So these, these keywords are helping these pages rank for those particular pages. And then when, when I actually come through to the page, there's a title and there's content on the page to find the perfect television, TVs. There's content on the page to help the page actually rank for those, for those words. Um, and then when I actually go to these pages themselves, and again, they're all interlinked, and there's lots of interlinking going on. The pages carry the context, they've got ratings and reviews, they've got lots of content about it, which is all unique to this website. And the good thing about user reviews is if you allow user reviews to happen um, for your products, then that's going to be completely unique content for your website. No one else is going to have that content. And that's always going to be growing and expanding. And if you allow people to rate the content, then, then those, those ratings can be fed into the results. So these guys have actually marked up their content. So when I looked at that book, they ranked number one for the book. Because of the navigation of breadcrumb, they've got the links to the navigation of breadcrumb, they've got the reviews ratings coming through. They've created dynamic logic which automatically feeds in certain parameters into their description. So those parameters being the name of the book, uh, the, the, that's, that's the title, and then they, put, they fed in the price, they fed in the offer, uh, and they fed in the phone numbers as well, so, and free delivery. So they've dynamically generated descriptions for millions of, millions of products by, by feeding that in through, uh, through systems. So, and the result is that you get a very nice, clean description, title, um, and, and you get prices and everything else in there. So that, and this is a dynamic site, so they, they've masked the URLs, um, and they've, they've, they've probably marked everything up. So you can see that they, they've been working hard to actually optimize their site forward properly so that it does get these results. But uh, Margaret said that to try and compete with them on a, on, a, on a grand scale would be impossible, but to get rankings for specific things, if you've got more content and more stuff about that thing, uh, then, then you should get a better ranking. But be, be wary that these guys are taking this seriously and every single product of theirs has a good a lot of content. There's a lot of content just for that single product. So, so the, 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 they're really, really um, hammering it quite heavily. Uh, can we go through the second link also? So how does that then come off? So which one? For oh, the same link. Uh, which is identical for Flipkart. Uh, Downloaded free. Which thing was that? Yeah. This one? Yeah. So, Can Love Happen Twice? It's in the title, it's in the description. Um, so, that's relevant. That's my keyword. And, and, and the download free would get you a lot of CDR. Yeah, it would get you a lot of CDR. It's a PDF ebook, isn't it? So that's what people are after. It's supposed to be today. Can Love Happen Twice? Yeah. 
can lower that the price is the actual URL name to the page name itself. When I go to the page itself, I'm assuming I've got a title. Let's have a look. So this is the page title. I'm uh, being blogs for it automatically feeds those titles in, so I'm assuming that's going to be the title here. Yeah, can love happen? So it's there again. Um, and it's can love happen? So as soon as uh, H2, there's content associated with it. It's got pictures. So it's got lots of look, it's got loads of content back. So again, it's got a lot of content about that particular thing. It's got the right markup. The, the elements are in the right places. Let's get check. So H1 down here. So again, they've got the right elements wrapped up. So it's not actually rocket science, but it does take quite a lot of effort to get these things to happen. But you can see just by creating the content, marking it up properly, you can actually get the rankings accordingly. Um, and then what's, what will happen, what you should do is when you, when you deal with your website, you need to look at your site from an architectural perspective. That's the first thing you do. Get the site architecturally sound so all the right pages are marked up. You then create the right content, and once you've done that, you'll get indexed and you'll start ranking somewhere. And it could be position five, and it could be position 555. It could be anywhere in the index, but you'll be there. Um, once you actually get to that ranking, you'll be the links that will get you up from where you are to the first page. And once you get to the first page, it will be the interactions that your web page has that will actually keep you on the first page. So if your web page is rubbish and no one interacts with it, you'll drop off the first page. What actually happens is you'll get to position 12, or thereabout, you get sampled. You start getting sampled onto position eight, nine, and you get sampled into the results. So you'll jump from set page two to page one, and you'll, you'll keep flicking in and out. So your ranking will do this. And as you're being sampled versus other people who are getting sampled, they will determine who deserves to go up. And if you're not any better than the other people who are already there, then you won't go up. But if you are better and you do get better, better engagement, then who will start pushing you up and you'll okay. start going up? They're not thinking about half an hour or Ready. So for 35 minutes, I think. Um, so I think you can see, get an idea, right? So there's obviously there's a lot to learn. Uh, we've been there now, we're picking up the mission learning. But I think the basic principles that we follow and we actually structure the SEO that we make ourselves contextually relevant to the user, actually give him value, then the search engine's job actually should rank you. So all these things aside, make a site which you think it answers the intent the user is looking for. And I didn't have any users you want to reach out to. Yeah. So one of the one concept that advised me that you have some white white spaces on your website. And just put content there which is not visible to user but only visible to user. <laughs> <laughs> definitely don't do that. Okay, so that's uh, that's called cloaking. And effectively, if I have a white page and you know, I put the keyword in and so what, what happened back in the day was the search engine would crawl the web and it would pick up keywords and based upon the amount of keywords that you had in your site, uh, it would go, well that web page has got to be much more effective because it's got a million mentions of the same word. So what people started doing is they started creating white content, white background with white text in it. And you'd have like simple, uh, maybe an image on top of that. So you'd, only the user would see the image but the web page had tons and tons of text in it. If you ever did that, Google would just come in and ban your site and you would just forget it. You wouldn't actually show up again. Because um, that's really, really naughty. So, so see, basically, uh, this is obviously a very, very bad example, but there are a lot of sophisticated black, uh, they call it black hat techniques, right? Uh, which are very, very sophisticated. And the reason why Google tests all these 500 different combinations, deletes pages, find out dates, is that it always tries to find out one innovative way. Uh, which a user has found to fool the engine. But eventually they catch up. And when they catch up, they penalize you that you will never show up in Google again. And they have penalized sites like BMW. BMW was using a technique uh, by an agency and they got penalized, they were removed from the Google index for 10 days. But BMW lost almost 10% of their market cap. Because just imagine, you go to Google, search for BMW, and the website doesn't show up. They just remove the Google index. That has happened with a lot of large companies. And BMW obviously was able to prove or say that, oh, they didn't know what was a mistake, sorry, whatever they said that. But it lost 10% market cap. And just imagine, for a car brand, if you, if you can't find a car, you can't research it, you're going to lose buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the basic concept. Yeah. 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 So they could be a lot of sophisticated techniques. You say, okay, when you're searching this, it's good. User will be a problem. Don't do it. So those are definitely black hat techniques. And just engines are very, very powerful here. So what you're saying actually used to work 20 years back. Last 19 years, that has not worked. So 
19 years is a long period of time. They've, they've learned a lot in the last 19 years. So today, they have become very sophisticated. Means the Google and even like the big of the world, they are way, way, way beyond those things. And uh, I think that the content you should also tell him that not tell this to anybody else. <laughs> Poor guy is trying to get banned from Google forever. <laughs> so it will be in that. Yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, guys, spending your whole Saturday with us. Uh, hope you got value for what we had to say. But this is a learning field. You know, we may be wrong in certain places. You have to use a judgment, keep learning, and this this hopefully search marketing can give you a competitive edge that you all are looking for. Thanks. Thank you.